we okay you all are going to get a little note um that we're recording and hopefully that's okay with everybody um we really like to be able to um share these webinars with folks after the fact because our main goal here is to really um share out to get the word out about electrification and how to do it efficiently and how to do it at scale because that's what we're looking at doing here my name is Shana hirschfield gold i am the climate coordinator for the city of oakland and um, in a moment we'll just uh, do quick introductions uh, of the other folks who are panelists and kind of uh, helping to lead this event um, but just to kind of set the stage, um, Oakland, as well as San Francisco and a number of other cities in California have um, set varying goals looking at how do we remove methane gas, otherwise known as natural gas, from all of our buildings over the next few decades. The research uh, and, and level of uh, technological preparation is um is advancing every single day we have all the technologies that we need to get there but we're still working on scale and we're still working on kind of um socializing the the skills in order to do this transition um, rapidly and efficiently and um, so today we're focusing on multifamily buildings and commercial buildings and um talking about how do we do electric service upgrades? How do we work with PG&E? Who, where are the shared responsibilities and costs for electric service upgrades? But also talking about how can we electrify um, efficiently so that we minimize the need for service upgrades as much as possible. And there are a number of reasons for doing that. Um, but before I get into that, um, let's go around uh, the, the room with the panelists and just do quick introductions. So Barry, I'll hand it to you. Hi, I'm Barry Hooper, a Senior Green Building Coordinator with the City of San Francisco, and I'll be sharing some uh, perspective and some local information. And uh, John? Hi, John Neal with the Association for Energy Affordability. Uh, we're going to talk about multifamily uh, electrification. Okay, great. And um, I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, um, Jeffrey. Do you want to just show yourself and introduce yourself real quick? Everyone, Jeffrey Wong, he Ham, sustainability analyst with the city of Oakland, and I'll be supporting this webinar from the background. Thank you so much. And Diana. Thanks, Shana. Hi, everybody. Diana Manetta with the San Francisco Department of the Environment Building Decarbonization Coordinator, also here. Um, moving the slides around. All right, I wanna um, express my deep thanks to um, our friends in San Francisco, the Association for Energy Affordability, and um, also at pg and &E, um, who will be joining us at some point. Um, if we could go to the next slide and dive in to the presentation. This is a look at the front cover of Oakland's uh, ECAP, or Equitable Climate Action Plan. This was adopted by our city council in 2020. And this uh, really kind of sets the stage, this plan um, sets the stage for how we are approaching electrification in buildings and why that is such an important goal. So if we can go on. Why are we so intent on electrification? Um, so I think probably everybody in the room knows what we mean when we say electrification, but just to make sure we're leveling the playing field, um, we're talking about replacing gas appliances with efficient electric alternatives and doing that with an eye towards health and safety and justice. And I wanna unpack those a little bit. So first of all, um, we know that gas is toxic, flammable, explosive. You see in front of you, um, uh, this is, <laughs> we fondly refer to this as one of our many fireball photos. This is a, an explosion actually in San Francisco um, just about three years ago. But we know that these happen um, 
periodically wherever there is natural gas and especially in an area that is as earthquake prone as we are here in the Bay Area, removing uh, as, as much uh, infrastructure that is carrying around flammable explosive stuff is a good goal. We also know that gas is highly toxic. Uh, children who grow up in homes with gas stoves are on average 40% more likely to develop asthma over their lifetime than kids who do not grow up in homes with electric, or sorry, with gas stoves. And that is across the board. So whether you have, um, you know, a, a vent system, operable windows, large or small um, space, that is an average at 40%. So um, there are a lot of other statistics that we could dive into, but for now, we'll suffice it to say that um, we've, we've learned uh, over the last 10 or so years how destructive gas is for our health. Um, and for safety. And we know that there are lots and lots of alternatives, as I mentioned. Um, and when I, when I say justice, I'm talking about affordability, kind of um, guarding against future and current volatility in gas prices. We know that gas uh, uh, utility rates are going up faster than electric rates. And um, we don't, we don't want to be in a position where um, those who can afford increases in energy prices the least are really stuck bearing, uh, bearing that burden of increasing costs, um, especially as liability for that aging infrastructure system increases over time. As we switch from gas to electricity, we also um, have the ability to increase our energy reliability um, as we are moving toward kind of grid modernization with distributed solar, with energy storage. There are a lot more possibilities for modernizing and enhancing the resilience of our energy systems. Electrification also gives us an opportunity to uh, kind of layer on related upgrades, health and safety upgrades in uh, our homes and buildings. So it's a really important opportunity for saying, how can we approach things in sort of a, co a more cost-effective manner? And then we know that um, electrification statewide is going to lead to a significant increase in jobs. There have been a number of studies looking at this so far. So again, what we're looking at is, is how do we do this right and efficiently and effectively so that we are you know, capturing these jobs locally so that folks in the Bay Area are kind of at the forefront leading this transition and that we're doing it in ways that are not unduly um, increasing costs for anybody. Let's move on to the next. If we can move on to the next slide. Okay, um, thank you so much. So there are a ton of uh, really wonderful opportunities that are actually um, making this transition that much easier um, and that much more attractive in the Bay Area. We have a very clean electric grid and it is, it is getting cleaner all the time. In the East Bay, we have East Bay Community Energy, which has pledged to be 100% carbon free and renewable by 2030. We have a ton of resources uh, in the Bay Area, again, providing rebates, incentives, information, even technical assistance, um, and not just in the Bay Area but statewide and now with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, you know, there are dramatic tailwinds that are uh, accelerating this and, and facilitating it even more. I mentioned um, workforce development initiatives, opportunities for kind of bundling energy resilience and electrification. And then, um, you know, just the, the technologies are, are here. And so we're, we're needing to really kind of jump on this, uh, on this wave. Um, and figure out how we can accelerate it. Next slide. This is Oakland's timeline. We uh, moved to uh, ensure that all new construction will be all electric two years ago. Uh, I have mentioned workforce several times, working with the Oakland Workforce Development Board um, to incorporate electrification training. We're doing ongoing community engagement. This workshop is one example of that. We're developing a roadmap for how we're going to get to all 
buildings being all electric by 2040. We're going to be build, bringing that roadmap to council uh, hopefully next summer. And um, sometime in 2023, we're going to be looking specifically at how can we encourage uh, electrification in the course of major renovations. So uh, stay tuned for that. I think this is where I hand it over to Barry um, so that we can kind of get a, a feel for what this looks like in our neighboring jurisdiction. If we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Shana. Sure. Um, so I'll share a few things really meant to compliment uh, Shana's great presentation. Uh, if we could move forward, it's probably two slides. Oh, there we go. Great. Perfect. Um, so we have a similar story. Uh, we're um, on the good side uh, through energy efficiency. Uh, gross electricity consumption is held steady or slightly declined while the built environment has and the total economy in our community has grown a great deal over the last 30 years. Um, and that combination of efficiency plus a lot of great growth of renewable electricity on the grid uh, from uh, you know, re renewable portfolio standard as well as uh, the growth, uh, recent growth of the Community Choice Program, Clean Power SF. And uh, the San Francisco is uh, served by two utilities, the pg e as well as the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, the municipal utility. The combination of all of that is what's summarized in this pie chart. And the result is, you know, we benefit from very clean electricity citywide and the remaining greenhouse gas emissions from the built environment basically coming from steam. Next slide, please. Um, the... Uh, if we look, though, it, the issues are broader, as Shana mentioned, than just greenhouse gas emissions. When we look at um, nitrous oxides, so the prime, some of the primary criteria air pollutants that cause respiratory distress and um, uh, trigger can trigger heart disease, uh, the total emissions from the residential building stock is greater than the total emissions from passenger vehicles today and uh, are comparable also in terms of emissions. Next slide. And so that boil, that adds up to um, a combination of issues regarding public health, public safety, the resilience of our energy infrastructure, and maybe counterintuitively, uh, we are one of our greatest risks is a seismic event, and the estimation is um, substantially faster recovery of the electric grid after a, a major tumbler compared to the gas grid, since gas piping tends to be um, somewhat more brittle and more challenging to, to repair. Uh, and those impact, those three categories of impacts fall most heavily on those with the fewest resources to prepare for the transition and to address those health impacts. So there's a, the unequitable impact on our community. Next slide. And so those, those concerns were very much featured in the extensive public outreach in recent years leading to San Francisco's Climate Action Plan in 2021. It is an extensive document looking comprehensively uh, at buildings, transport, and the entire uh, set of emissions uh, that result from the city's economy and its operation. So I'm just going to highlight a couple items on the next slide, please. Um, so if we look at the built environment, particularly multifamily and commercial, um, what we're the reason we're coming together is to highlight how electrification is an opportunity to address all of those problems, and that um, there's both there's really two pieces of information that we need to be exposed to, and one is that careful design uh, can, in many many cases, either reduce or eliminate the scale of electric service upgrade necessary. And so a, when one is successful in, at uh, utilize, electrifying with existing service, the process is faster, simpler, and less complicated and can have a better result in terms of uh, function. Of course, it depends on the situation. And so sometimes service upgrades are necessary. And so today we're also exploring process, timing, and cost when that, that occurs. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. A couple bits of context, welcome context to keep in mind are in addition to the state recently adopting greenhouse gas emission and uh, criteria of air pollutant emission goals that are similar to the cities. Um, 
Of course, the federal government has taken some, some great action last month, and that means for commercial buildings, um, a substantial expansion of uh, incentives that are available for efficiency improvements, and that can, in commercial buildings, include electrification. Uh, the incentives are much greater for projects that uh, hire and rely on prevailing wage and apprenticeship, so uh, organized labor. Um, in addition, it's worth keeping in mind that the solar tax credit was extended, although there are specific limitations on solar PV and secondary networks. We'll explore that a bit today. And then also to be aware that there are new incentives both for commercial and fleet electric vehicles, as well as for uh, portions of the charging infrastructure. So that's not our focus today, but we really have to acknowledge it because uh, vehicle charging is a generally a much bigger source of um, site electric infrastructure impact than, um, than, than building electrification. There are definitely are, are exceptions, but really we're gonna need to focus on how to integrate electric vehicles effectively. And in a lot of cases uh, that does tend to involve establishing separate service for the EVs. Next slide. Uh, if we look at multifamily, there's a similar story. There's a dramatic expansion of tax credits, a clarification that those definitely are available for multifamily and do not conflict with the low-income housing tax credit that is a key uh, source of capital for affordable housing, uh, new construction, and historically renovations. Um, and so it, it, it is a resource that's available to multifamily owners. There are two major federal programs coming online, most likely middle of next year. Um, and in California, uh, all the details really TBD other than what's explicit in the federal law. The federal law is that those um, incentives do favor, uh, in both cases, favor low-income households, but the homes rebate program is, <clears throat> is available also to uh, a, a people of much wider variety of incomes. And the uh, high efficiency electric home rebate program is principally targeted at uh, helping those who need the most assistance. And then the solar tax credit is also directly relevant because um, particularly for multifamily uh, and residential, um, the uh, addition of PV can really help mitigate uh, electric costs and operating costs and can really make an electrification project more financially favorable. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to an expert on multifamily, uh, John Neal, to talk about some of the uh, successes and challenges uh, that, that he's experienced in service market segment. Thank you so much, Barry. And just before uh, you jump in, John, I, I wanna acknowledge that there are some questions that are already coming up in the Q&A and these are perfect. The, uh, the two that I see so far are definitely going to be answered in the course of our presentation. Keep them coming and we will get to them as many as we can in the Q&A at the end. Take it away, John. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is our experience in multifamily uh, strategies we found for electrifying multifamily buildings and some of the hurdles. Um, I see that there's a lot of designers uh, and some building owners in the audience. So I think this content will hopefully apply well to you. Um, I have way more slides um, than I have time to cover. So I will just say that we have um, like full-size trainings that people will be able to join and I'll try and put that in a chat uh, later. So I'll try to skip over uh, a little bit of this content where needed. Um, but multifamily, um, especially in um, the sort of mild Bay Area climate um, tend to have um, sort of minimal uh, existing electrical capacity. Um, we tend to find that making electrical upgrades in these buildings to support full electrification can be um, expensive and time consuming. And we, um, as a result of that, really try to find ways to work within existing electrical service size. And that's somewhat on a continuum. Um, if a multifamily building has, uh, is newer, has electric cooking, um, or has cooling, uh, the odds of being able to fully electrify it uh, sort of increase without triggering a service upgrade. Uh, but if you have all gas and uses for all these sort of domestic hot water, heating, cooking, et cetera, um, the odds of being able to avoid a service upgrade are, are, are uh, lower. Next slide, please. So some of the ways that we um, 
you can go to, to the next slide. Uh, some of the ways that we navigate around this are, um, oh, sorry, maybe I have a lag here. Go back one. There we go. Um, are really working with an integrated approach with the design and construction team to make sure that all the proposed equipment is sized sort of down to the like sharp pencil approach to make sure we have exactly what we need in the building, not oversized. Um, we're incorporating all the sort of envelope or in the case of domestic hot water or central heating systems, we're incorporating all the distribution improvements that are available uh, to make sure we're not sort of adding excess uh, electrical demand that isn't really needed. Um, and when we have sort of done that first pass and we find there's still not enough electrical capacity, um, there are always opportunities for us to sort of like play with increasing the equipment efficiency to reduce demand, going after additional um, envelope or load reduction um, opportunities. And that's sort of on the sort of cost effective sort of like trade off balance where we look at load reduction costs versus electrical service uh, upgrade uh, or other electrical upgrade. Um, in Beautiful. Okay. Take it away. Never a dull moment. Yeah, um, I didn't even get to any of the controversial stuff. So I, I was like, oh, they're shutting me down. I've gone too far. Uh, everybody put whatever jokes you have in the chat. Um, okay, so um, I was saying that uh, we tried to integrate design approach to make sure that uh, we're sort of looking at all the opportunities to collaborate around minimizing our electrical impacts in the building. We have to opt to turn over every stone, look for every opportunity to, to do that. Um, here are a few things that we do. So um, we look at increasing efficiency, reducing loads. Uh, we're always looking to limit electric resistance in the system if it exists. And then something came up on a project um, uh, last week where we realized that um, the mechanical or the, sorry, the plumbing engineer had included sort of full uh, plumbing redundancy with the new water heating system, meaning um, they needed, they provided two heat pumps to uh, provide water heating to the building, even though only one was necessary. And while that's a common and, and good practice for sort of, um, you know, equipment breakdowns, it, it increased the electrical connected load and was um, problematic from a sizing perspective. So really just sort of having that conversation with the whole team, understand all the impacts and opportunities of sort of what's being designed, what's being proposed is useful. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Just gonna breeze through some of these. These just give you a quick snippet um, in idea of what the impacts are between say a um, highly efficient sort of right size system on the HVAC here on the left, uh, let's say a one ton um, mini split system versus a three ton electric resistance backup uh, heat pump system. It's almost 10 times uh, the connected load um, and the same sort of holds true for the water heating equipment on the side, which is unitary, uh, not central. Next slide, please. Uh, cooking is uh, sort of the final, I, I call it sort of the final frontier in electrification of multifamily. And that's sort of based on what I talked about at the beginning in that, um, you know, if you find that you have existing gas cooking in a building, uh, you're more likely that you don't have the electrical capacity to uh, fully electrify the building without triggering some sort of upstream electrical upgrade. Um, almost always you'll be required to do some sort of feeder upgrade to apartment subpanels to increase the capacity to, to the panels uh, if you're electrifying cooking. Um, and while it's not always you're, you know, if you ran sort of the standard electrical calcs, you'll probably find that the service size is also not sized um, appropriately to manage um, electrifying the cooking. I have an example of the contrary that I'll try to get to at the end here. Um, but some alternate solutions we have looked at, um, some are sort of optimistic rose tinted glasses that I have about a future low amp induction stove product that might be available in the market in the future uh, that would reduce the sort of peak connected load of a stove. Um, we found that um, and electric and induction ranges are sort of designed sort of for the user to be able to have peak, you know, every um, burner sort of turned to the max, um, uh, even though folks don't typically cook that way. So we're looking at opportunities to encourage a low amp induction stove to get developed. 
Uh, we've seen some pr uh, projects, uh, especially in sort of senior buildings, studios, uh, one bedrooms uh, that maybe aren't a full family size, move to a cooktop uh, with, say, a built-in microwave oven instead of a full-size range. That also can help reduce the amount of uh, connected load. And the one thing that I want to emphasize is we, we really need to ensure that in, when we're electrifying cooking, that we always use induction cooking. Um, for anybody that's cooked on electric coil uh, they, and, and induction, they know that, that there's a major difference and it's much more satisfying to cook on induction than it is on um, electric coil. So we want folks to adopt and, and appreciate that. Uh, and I, I think um, there's been maybe more uh, concern around the adoption and the, the compatible cookware um, than is really sort of necessary, but we have seen trainings and then like gift cards or pot and pan sets being a useful way to sort of um, sort of get around sort of concerns with uh, pot and pan compatibility and sort of folks being um, ready to use induction. Next slide, please. Okay, so how, how is the electrical engineer going to approach sort of confirming whether you can fit all this new equipment? Um, there's sort of two uh, standard sort of calculation processes. One is the deemed calc, which is what folks typically uh, default to. It's the most conservative calculation we find. It uses both sort of proposed equipment and some deemed values when determining if there's enough capacity in the building. And while there are some sort of exceptions and levers that can be pulled, it still typically produces a conservative uh, result. We have had good success with engineers using what they call load monitoring study. Um, that looks at the actual peak demand in the building, either uh, during a 30-day period, um, representative period of, of across the year, or peak uh, demand values across an entire year. And uh, with our smart meters that we have today, you can download this data uh, in a few minutes. So it's, it's readily available. Um, the load monitoring study will essentially tell you how much actual demand is in the building and how much remaining capacity exists uh, once the engineer sort of looks at the infrastructure. Uh, and that study can be performed at the building service, at say a panel, a specific panel that might be in question whether there's capacity. So it can be sort of used strategically throughout the building to, to check uh, capacity. And then um, hopefully PG&E can speak to this, but I, I wanted to emphasize that those two processes are used for pulling permits and confirming that your uh, system will meet electrical code. Um, but the utilities have their own um, load checks that they'll do too as well when, when reviewing sort of like an application for an upgraded service size. And um, they have, in my experience, been uh, more generous with um, doing those calculations. So we've had a couple of projects where the engineer initially thought that they would need, and I'm just going to make an example up here, like an 800 amp service. And the utility came back and said, oh, we actually think that um, we'll be able to give you a 600 amp service based on our sort of diversity calculations and loads. And we think that's going to be enough. And that can really impact uh, feasibility. Next slide. Um, so what happens if we do all that, we're still struggling to uh, make it work with the existing service. So double check that we've looked at all those sort of pathways. Uh, we want to look at the low amp equipment options, the load reduction, efficiency, et cetera. Um, we've had projects that looked at moving from uh, master meter or sort of central equipment, like central heating to in-unit heating or vice versa, because sometimes that can help um, shift electrical load, say, from uh, fully loaded sort of apartments uh, to a less loaded uh, common area uh, service. Um, and then really dive in and make sure that the default values that the engineer are using in their calculations are no longer default, that they've been like actual, like their actual real values. Um, a really fun anecdote story I got here from a coworker uh, in the past few weeks was project was struggling to get um, their project to be fully electrified. And uh, we looked in at it, we're like, oh, the garbage disposal you have here is um, showing that's pulling like a thousand volt amps, but the one that we saw uh, was only pulling 400 volt amps. Uh, the engineer went back and they ran, re ran the numbers and like, oh, now we have capacity to put in the water heater that you're recommending, uh, the heat pump water heater. So it can really come down to something as simple as that. Um, so we'd encourage, you know, sort of going through and double checking all the, all the details. 
if a service upgrade is needed and it will be needed, you know, sometimes and often if you're doing full electrification, we really want to make sure that the project team doesn't kill the project as soon as the prospect of getting a service upgrade uh, is on the table. Uh, yes, it can be, you know, can take a long time. It can be expensive, but um, because that utility conversation can often result in a more sort of an easier pathway for you, we want to make sure that folks sort of go through and go to that step so you don't kill the project too early. And uh, you can always do partial electrification. There's always going to be at least something uh, that you can upgrade. So you can always take a take an active step forward. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, when you're pulling together a team to do these projects, uh, really emphasize that you're getting creative thinkers and problem solvers. Folks with prior experience are helpful. An integrated design um, approach where everybody's sort of working together is gonna be really needed. And um, larger projects will likely need engineers. Smaller projects you might be able to do uh, as a design build approach. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a, an example. I'm just gonna sort of click through some of these, um, but just, this is down in SoCal, um, project retrofit. It's 40 fourplex uh, units um, that had in-unit gas ranges um, and furnaces uh, and central gas water heating. And the owner's goal at our exercise was full electrification and can we do it without um, upgrading uh, the building's electric service? And can we do it without upgrading the 40 amp service to each apartment? Uh, next slide. So we ran five different scenarios uh, with the design team. Um, so this version was a electric conduction range, a multi-head split system uh, for heat pump, uh, heating, cooling, and a central water heating system. And we can just sort of zoom in on the very bottom of that table. Uh, we're showing that each apartment would need sort of a nominal 70 amp service. Um, so we were sort of over, um, over our 40 amp budget. Next slide. And then we said, okay, well, what if we sort of played around with moving to in-unit water heating um, just to see if that shifted the scale. So that's sort of for reference that boosted our required ampacity up by a few. So it's, a, it, it's higher than we wanted. Next slide, please. Okay, then we said, okay, let's really right size this HVAC or use a, a different type of HVAC system that will be a slightly smaller connected load. That helped a lot. That brought us down to uh, 50, 51 amps. Next slide. It still weren't there yet. So then we said, okay, let's get super aggressive. Let's put in a super efficient uh, heat pump system, an induction cooktop, and convection microwave. And we were basically there. I think we could have gotten um, gotten down under 40 if we wanted to. Um, uh, next slide. We ran one other scenario where we said, what happens if we just move to central, uh, if you can go to the next slide, that'd be great. If we go to central HVAC um, system that was met, uh, sort of like on the house meter, um, how would that have unloaded the apartments? And that got us down to, uh, you know, well below the 40 amp level. So this just sort of shows you sort of the spread of different solutions and sort of the process thinking that we had with the team. Ultimately, none of these scenarios triggered uh, a utility upgrade. Every building had its own sort of like pole drop from an alley. Um, so that was that was good news. And the owners sort of ran some cost scenarios with their contractor. And ultimately, they decided to just upgrade the feeders uh, to each apartment uh, to upsize their uh, panel and their panel size without touching the building service. Um, so they didn't have to go through utility sort of process for upgrading their service, but they did have a you know, somewhat invasive pro uh, project to run a new electrical uh, feeder to each apartment. Next slide. Um, Barry had a great slide on all of the sort of pending um, incentives uh, that are gonna be available. Uh, those uh, should be able to stack in some combination with the sort of massive suite of uh, incentive programs that we also have today. So. This is just sort of a smattering of the ones that um, exist. So that's the uh, that's my content. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Uh, we are going to now hand it over to PG&E. I think is that right? Uh, to, oh, 
No, right. sorry, Barry. Talk about commercial. <laughs> Thanks, Shana. Um, <clears throat> the, um, so if you've been following along and you joined us on September 7th, then uh, just to really <laughs> oversimplify our, our pr presentations, um, you know, there is a, a generally a straightforward path to electrification for existing single family. Um, and we went through the exceptions, so really recommend that webinar uh, on YouTube if you haven't seen it. Provide the link as a follow-up. Uh, for mul existing multifamily, the most common scenario here in the Bay Area is not to have cooling in the existing building and to, and to have uh, gas cooking. And so John went over how that's quite a bit more challenging in general. Um, and now let's look, let's pivot over and look at commercial buildings. Next slide, please. Um, so if we summarize the content of the city of San Francisco's Climate Action Plan uh, and its implication for existing buildings, apologize, this was the slide I was leading up to earlier today. Um, the, um, the, the Climate Action Plan includes really two big themes uh, that are specific to technical and policy action. And one is to build upon our existing policies of energy benchmarking disclosure, as well as not only the availability of renewable electricity, but a pending requirement that the largest commercial buildings transition to and subscribe to renewable electricity products. Those are going to be complemented, though, by uh, the, the plan calls for additional policies uh, that will um, require planning for decarbonization, uh, set a date certain deadline for certain buildings to complete the process, emphasizing 2035 for the largest commercial buildings, and to seek regular check-ins on, on progress uh, toward those goals, and then to recognize that some flexibility will be necessary, and that is likely to come down to um, some form of fee uh, that would, where the revenue, uh, the, the Climate Action Plan calls for the revenue to be invested in helping those who need the most help in low-income and affordable housing. Next slide. <clears throat> That can sound um, particularly challenging. I'm having technical difficulties continue. Um, not sure if I'm frozen to everyone or not, but my screen I is. Can hear you. Oh, great. Um, so, a, a, a key... frozen. I think we're just having trouble with advancing the slides. Okay. Well, what this slide would say is, you know, a key context is the energy code itself. And so a common perception of what I've just shared about the city level is that there be, um, therefore, the city is taking uh, a action that would somehow conflict with the energy code. And that's not where we're going. The energy code itself is evolving. Uh, it's certainly taking time, but it is moving to better support efficient electrification over time. And the constraints uh, that really apply in both uh, San Francisco and Oakland or any community in California is we don't have legal authority to waive Title 24. So that means the building codes in general, the safety codes, as well as the energy code for efficiency. So efficiency requirements do apply. And the short version of that is generally we should not be translating switching to electric as switching to electric resistance, particularly electric resistance boilers. Next slide. Um, so that can sound really challenging. How do we how do we actually get this done? How do we electrify the large commercial buildings in particular with complex built up systems? Is that something for only you know uh, the experts, or is it a can, can we provide some insights that might be more generally useful? Next slide. <clears throat> and so I'm going to really look at how scale. Uh, has a big implication for um, just e even generalizing about commercial buildings. We'll look at a number of different scales of buildings, uh, both locally and even take a peek over for some inspiration from the East Coast. Next slide. Um, so starting small, uh, SPUR happens is a local nonprofit organization, happens to operate its own building. It's relatively recently constructed and therefore uh, quite efficient. Of course, there's always room to improve energy efficiency, uh, but that's not today's topic. The main takeaway is that it's single use of gas is uh, for um, burners that are embedded in the rooftop units uh, that provide heating uh, when necessary. 
And therefore its decarbonization plan is um, thankfully really straightforward. Uh, when those units are replaced, they will specify heat pumps. That just means that the AC unit would be able to provide heating as well as cooling. And the good news there is that is straightforward a permit uh, that has no change to electric peak because in our climate, it's the cooling that determines the peak electric uh, consumption of nearly all uh, space conditioning designs. And therefore, there isn't even a, a big cost impact. Um, so you can get more details from SPUR itself. I'll emphasize that one happy example. Next slide. If we scale up to a little bit larger buildings that are characteristic of our downtowns, um, or <clears throat> are more common in our downtowns and less common elsewhere, um, let's look at on the Embarcadero. Uh, 188 the Embarcadero is a facility that's owned and occupied by Google. And they took this as a... Uh, opportunity to where they had, you know, entirely had control over their facility to pilot electrification. And they did that also it was a pretty efficient building. Also, there's always room for improvement. Um, and it does have both it, uh, gas uses for uh, both water heating and uh, space conditioning. Uh, they piloted the capital planning tool that uh, we've been developing with local stakeholders called the Strategic Decarbonization Assessment. Please do contact me if you'd like to get more intro about that. Um, and that helped them define what the costs would be if they didn't make change in their building and really use that for uh, important context for the decisions going forward. And it helped them set uh, clear goals for what they intended to do. And that those clear goals were really essential because they had fantastic engineers who had some assumptions about what the owner's goal were. And so they brought back efficiency projects that would have kept the building mixed fuel. And it was really, it was a learning moment to see that there was opportunity to be very explicit about what the goal was. Um, <clears throat> the outcomes are, they are, um, uh, have moved to construction and um, so essentially moved to heat pumps and they found opportunities uh, by looking carefully at it, they found opportunities for upgrade at, at times of uh, operational improvement and having a plan in advance was really key to their uh, making progress. Next slide. Let's scale up. Let's look at uh, a nearly a million square feet over on the, also happens to be in the Barcadero over at Levi's Plaza. So there are uh, six different facilities on a campus that was built in 1981. Uh, the uh, current owner, Jamestown, made a commitment along with that purchase to uh, get to net zero operating operations for their facilities by 2025. Because these are uh, facilities from the early 80s, they have all of the um, common systems in larger buildings, chillers, cooling towers, uh, the works. Um, and it means that there are some initial challenges that uh, to their, their team had to evaluate. Uh, an air source heat pump, generally larger than a boiler, generally smaller than the combination of a boiler and a chiller, but the boiler and the chiller may not occupy the same space. So there can be a real space constraint for the engineers to figure out how to make the new system work, how to redesign within the existing building. Um, the supply water temperature is a common issue that you know, boilers uh, generally uh, uh, are readily able to provide 180 degree hot water and often designs are built around that. And so they, that required a rethink since heat pumps, uh, and we'll talk about this a tiny bit more, uh, heat pumps aren't necessarily, that's not necessarily the best strategy with the heat pump to try to replicate that same water temperature. Um, and then they also had some electric service capacity constraints and they did evaluate uh, efficiency, electric efficiency on loads overall in the building. And so with some redistribution and improvements in efficiency in general, but also some, some rewiring of the sort, similar sort to what John was uh, describing, uh, they were able to reallocate that existing service within the facility. So there were electrical changes, but not changes to electric service infrastructure. Um, so it's really spoke to the importance of communication and planning, uh, exactly the themes that John was talking about, but did provide some evidence that um, this change is possible and similar themes emerge to what we heard even in the single family examples. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if we scale, keep scaling up from there, uh, we can switch over to New York, uh, the city of, sorry, the New York state, NYSERDA has been uh, running something called the um, Empire Building Challenge, uh, where they have been uh, facilitating uh, teams of engineers and property owners in New York to plan for decarbonization, in, partly in compliance with New York City's laws, although the participating buildings are generally in New York, but not limited to being in New York City. Um, and the um, taking two of the more in, most interesting to me examples are 345 Hudson and 100 Avenue of the Americas. Those are both buildings constructed in the early 1930s. New York's, of course, a really different climate, but essentially a harsher one with hot summers, cold winters. The challenge was how to plan for decarbonization while those buildings remained occupied uh, because these buildings are not operated to manage energy costs. They're operated to collect rent from commercial tenants and to, to maintain the services that they provide to their tenants. Um, and they had, were served by steam heating and some PTAC uh, cooling, uh, essentially room by room. They had a similar issue of space constraints, electric service constraints, and the solution uh, kind of took advantage of those existing conditions, used water source heat pumps to, as well as dedicated outside air with energy recovery to um, move heat around the building opportunistically. So it varies a lot throughout the year. It's a more common solution in Scandinavia, but it's a less of having a heat pump uh, for example, pull heat from out, outdoor air and more moving the heat from one part of the building to another. And the specifics of that vary seasonally. Next slide. Uh, and the upshot of that being nearly a 50% reduction in gross energy consumption. Um, and so the themes that kind of come out of those um, smaller, medium-sized projects, one element of them that I'll highlight uh, is looking at the question of that, that assumption of, do we need 180 degree hot water if that's the existing condition? And a growing moon of engineers are asking, well, how, what water temperature do we need? How low can we go? Because lower temperatures um, provide a lot more options in terms of which heat pump up might be suitable for um, providing that water. And that affects the both the gross electric consumption as well as the, the space constraints. Um, and so there are four different, uh, highlighting four different examples where uh, water temperatures as low as 120, 110 degrees is actually uh, meets the, enables continued operation of a similar system. That can be the lowest, lowest cost option and the least amount of redesign necessary. Uh, because those are water supply water temperatures that are compatible with the most common types of uh, air source heat pumps. Um, where really 175, 180 degrees is absolutely necessary. There are combined air source and water source heat pumps that can deliver water at that temperature. That is generally not a, uh, that's a pretty energy intensive solution, but it can be relatively straightforward in terms of the constructability. Um, there are other options, for example, different refrigerants provide different temperatures of hot water. And so we've seen examples in the 160 degree range. And then um, really, you know, uh, it, sometimes there's opportunity for complete rethink of the system and that can yield the very most energy efficient option with very low um, supply water temperatures. So all of this is a, um, very brief introduction to much more detailed information that I want to highlight. The um, Worthen Foundation Building Decarbonization Practice Guide is a reference, as well as um, the materials published by the um, Empire Building Challenge and a number of other resources that we'll share with you, as well as full day classes that are regularly offered uh, at the via pg and &E. uh, Next slide, please. So, Really getting to our, the point, our transition, electrification often provides an opportunity for um, uh, redesign, functional redesign. Planning is essential to taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, e efficiency can very much help in reducing cost and complexity, but nonetheless, there are, will be times where electric service must be upgraded after applying all the tricks and tools. And so that's why we're next gonna hear from 
uh, our colleagues at pg e uh, starting with Khalil Johnson, who will lead us through the process and context uh, and expectations if you're an existing pg e customer for um, upgrading electric service. Khalil, are you, um, we've had a little few technical difficulties. Are, are you with us? I, I hope I am. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, fantastic. I hear you. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, I think that we can go one slide ahead. Perfect. All right. So thanks, Barry, for the warm handoff. Before we get started with the presentation or introductions, we want to pause quickly, just like we did with the single family webinar, and just offer our deep thank you to the organizers of this thing, uh, the cities of Oakland and San Francisco. It is not easy to pull together a webinar of this magnitude, especially one that is held in a virtual space. So just wanted to offer my offer our, our kudos. I think that we are two for two so far with single family in this one. We really got a lot of good feedback and a lot of good questions, not just during the single family webinar, but also after. I think Nick, Nick in our in my inbox is, is full of, of, of good questions. Nick is probably is killing me. <laughs> um, just of all the questions that we got from folks, but we're looking forward to that type of engagement in this webinar and, and thereafter. So with that said, I, my name is Kahlo Johnson. I am a strategic analyst in the decarbonization department here at Pacific Gas and Electric. And I am joined by my colleague, my colleague uh, Nick. Nick, if you are there, can you come off mute and introduce yourself? All right, hopefully Nick will be here at some point. I'll send him a quick text. Maybe we have to to uh, to upgrade him to to panelist. We'll get going with the agenda. So we're we're really hoping that folks that are listening to us will walk away from this conversation with a better understanding of the added load process. And so to start, we're just going to do a general overview of some of the momentum that we're seeing in the building and transportation space. And that'll take us to where on the grid we are seeing impacts of electrifying those two sectors and where, where we're seeing some of the constraints. And that'll be a good segue into the primary trigger of electric service upgrades. And then we'll spend most of our time discussing the added load process and timeline. And we'll wrap up with a couple helpful resources, well, resources we hope will be helpful, and try and answer any key questions that you have. And since we didn't get Nick, I'll just do a quick intro for him. Nick is a, an all-star industrial engineer that serves the cities of Oakland and San Francisco. He is a really, really good resource. He's actually in the field today and calling in and will be on to answer many, if not all of your, your, your technical questions. So looking forward to that part of the discussion. All right, next slide to get us going. Great, all right. So, as many of you are probably well aware, California is aggressively pursuing electrification of both the transportation and building sectors. We're seeing really strong policy goal setting in the transportation sector in particular, targeted at light duty, medium and heavy duty vehicles to reduce their, their respective GHG emissions. So many of you may have heard or seen in the media that California recently became the first state in the nation to ban the sale of gas vehicles, gas passenger vehicles by 2035. Or in other words, we have that first box there that says that 100% of passenger vehicle sales must be zero emission by 2035. There are a couple of other ambitious goals that are currently just executive orders, but we're expecting them to be codified as a part of the California Air Resources Board's Advanced Clean Fleet proceeding. The, the second box here is that 100% of operations of, of drayage trucks must be zero emission by 2035. And then finally, 100% of on-road medium and heavy-duty vehicles must be zero emission by 2045. So again, lots of clear momentum towards electrification in the transportation sector. And we're seeing gaining momentum in the building sector as well. Many of you may have celebrated the, the recent approval of a plan by the California Air Resources Board to ban the sale of gas, water, and space heating appliances by 2030. So if you have a gas furnace or a gas water heater in your multifamily or commercial building and that expires, 
on or after uh, the year 2030, you won't be able to go and, and find it at your local retail store because it'll be banned. And we are, we're also seeing a growing number of cities, Oakland and San Francisco included, of course, our star cities, that are considering electrification retrofit targets. And finally, in the building space, the California Energy Commission recommended a goal of about 6 million heat pumps or so being installed by 2030, again, to drive some of that GHG reduction. This is not by any stretch of the imagination an exhaustive list. There is so much happening in California to electrify both of these sectors, but just meant to give you some indication of, of how, how aggressive California is in electrifying both of these key sectors of the economy. Next slide. So where are we seeing the impacts of electrifying both of these sectors on the grid? Before I answer that question, I wanna define for us maybe two or three key electric grid infrastructure components. So the, the first here is primary lines, and then the second is secondary lines. We, I'm gonna lean on this illustration to the right of the text in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So if you see, if you look closely, there are uh, electrical lines going to the very top of that of that pole, that utility pole. And those are considered to be high voltage primary lines. And so the distinguishing characteristic between primary and secondary is essentially voltage class. So those lines operate as low as four kV or 4,000 volts. Um, they go to 12 kV, 21 kV, and the highest we have in our service territory is 34.5 kV. There, I'd say that the most common of this voltage class is probably 12 kV in pg and service territory. And the least common is the largest here, so the 34 or 5 kV. Only San Francisco is, is, is the city, San Francisco was the only city where, where they receive primary distribution at 34 or 5. And the other, the, the lowest, the 4 kV there, there are some areas, not many, but there are some areas in pg and service territory that are served by 4 kV. Uh, primary distribution, like downtown San Jose, as an example. So if you look at the photo again, you see that there are a bank of transformers, and those transformers are stepping down the voltage, the higher voltage from the primary line to a lower voltage. And there are secondary lines coming out of the bottom of that transformer. And the electricity, the voltage of that electricity on those lines is much lower than the voltage for the primary line. So that, that voltage ranges from 120 to, to 480 volts. If 120 volts sounds familiar to you, which should, because that's the common voltage for your, your, let's say your living room receptacle and your multifamily living unit um, for things like cell phone chargers and other plug loads. And you might even have, if you're fortunate enough, um, a 240 volt outlet in your, in your multifamily building, as an example, where your dryer is or, in, at a commercial kitchen with a uh, uh, electrical water heater, you might have a 240 volt outlet. So those are the common um, voltage levels that you get in your building. So that's primary and secondary. So to bring this back to the conversation around commercial and large multifamily buildings, unlike single family buildings, what we discussed in the last webinar, where we said that a lot of the electrification of those buildings drive upgrades on the secondary system primarily. With commercial and large multifamily buildings, depending on the size of those, of those buildings, that can drive upgrades on not just the secondary, but the primary distribution system as well. And if it's really large, like some of the examples, I think that Barry was going through, um, you could you could see needed upgrades maybe as 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 upstream as the substation. So it really depends, of course. But those are the types of upgrades you can see on the grid, specifically or particularly if you are installing EV charging, um, which is becoming more and more common. We're seeing with commercial buildings like workplace charging, or you might see it at the Target and multifamily buildings as well. We actually have a electric vehicle program that helps incentivize the installation of of level two chargers in multifamily buildings. So EV chargers are, are also driving upgrades at, at multifamily and commercial buildings as well. All right, next slide. So primary trigger for electric service upgrades, we discussed this a little bit in the single family one, it's not much different here. The upsizing of the main switch gear or termination section is a primary cause of service or, or if need be primary upgrades. Um, so we have a couple just illustrative photos here of, of multifamily switch gear, switch gear equipment and commercial switch gear equipment. We can go to the next slide. 
I see it's coming up slowly, but what you would see here is our, our four categories of the, a little bit too far, yeah. You could go back maybe one for me. I think it's just one. While you're working on that, I'll just narrate the slide. So um, before this slide, it discusses, actually you can stay here if you want Diana. Um, before this slide, it discusses the four stages of the added load process. They're not much different than the added load process for single family from a pg &E perspective. Additional load is additional load, whether it's coming from a single family building, multifamily building or commercial. And so the, the added load process of the application and, and load assessment and all that is, is very, very similar. Um, so there are four categories, the first, sorry, four stages. The first one is customer planning and application. The second is load assessment and or service design. The third is contract and payment. And then finally, construction and energization. Oh, cool, you got to go back. All right, <laughs> forward again. All right, so the, the first step here is, is, is customer planning and application. Before I get into the meat of this slide, I just want to orient you to the structure of it. So in the top left-hand corner, we have three rows in black text, PG&E responsibility, applicant responsibility, and timeline. We wanted to, as a part of going through the stages and steps of, of the added load process, give you some sense of the responsibility distinction between PG&E and customers. We often get questions from customers such as, when will PG&E tell me what size electric panel I need if I'm electrifying? And, you know, as you'll hear throughout me walking through this slide, that's something that you'll need a contractor for as opposed to PG&E telling you. So hopefully the information provided in the top left-hand corner is helpful. All right, so looking at the illustration here in the bottom left, while that's not an illustration of a commercial building or a multifamily building, this photo still serves as a good, as a good talking point for the distinctions between PG&E owned and maintained infrastructure and customer owned and maintained infrastructure. So I'm gonna walk you through this, starting from the top left where the high voltage power distribution lines are. Um, and then we'll, we'll land at the, the big red house on the right. So as we discussed on the previous slide, we got somewhere between four and 34, five KV running through those high voltage power lines. And then we have the, the transformer, the pole mounted transformer um, that's connected to those power lines, stepping down the voltage to, to something between 120 and 480. The line between the pole and the house, that's the, that's the service line. So that's carrying that, that lower level voltage through the service entrance conductor, through the weather head, down through the service mast into the meter base. And this is where we kind of get to the, the dividing line between the customer side and utility side infrastructure. So the meter is owned by PG&E and everything behind the meter is considered owned by owned and maintained by the customer. I should have said this out the, at the outset, but one thing that's important here is that you know the the, the distinction between the infra infrastructure here isn't actually uniquely determined by PG&E. It's it's explicitly detailed in Electric Rules 15 and 16, which are governed by the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so with that, I want to just quickly go over the underground configuration we have here as well. So on the ground here in the illustration, you have the pad-mounted transformer. That's care and, and uh, connected to that, you have the underground electric service cable that goes from the pad mounted transformer underground into the into the customer's meter base. So um, that's underground and, and, and overhead in a nutshell. The everything behind the meter is customer owned and operated. So that includes the service panel, of course. That includes any end uses, um, water heaters, etc. And those are the responsibility of the customer um, to own and maintain. One thing that we wanted to, to um, this is in the, the applicant responsibility here. So it's, it's the applicant's responsibility to acquire a contractor, given that, you know, they're making changes to the end uses behind the meter, um, to obtain that contractor and have that contractor determine the electrification needs as a result of their project. All right, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so customer planning and application. So the PG&E responsibility here is to contact the applicant within three days and confirm application details. 
the application responsibility, of course, is to first submit that added load application, and you can do that at yourprojects.pgne.com. And then the timeline here, a part of it is applicant dependent, of course, it's up to the applicant when they decide to submit the, the added load application. And the timeline for PGE response, again, is, is approximately three days or so, just to confirm the, the details of that application. Helpful links we have here, and this is a um, smart link, so you can click on that and, and it'll take you somewhere else. But this essentially walks you through how to navigate the added load application, sorry, how to navigate the your projects at pgne.com uh, portal. So you can find the added load process. We have a couple snapshots here for you just to give you a sense of, of what you need to do. So um, once you've logged in, you would click on start new application that's outlined in red there. And then you click on new electric or gas services or change to existing uh, electric or gas services. And then you click on electric and gas and then finally new service connection because by you adding new load, you, you, you may require additional service. And the table to the right of the photos, we have uh, just a few examples of useful information um, for you to include in your added load application. All right, next slide. No, okay, uh, okay, great. So the load assessment and or service design process. The pg &E responsibility here is to perform the load assessment and inform applicant of findings. The applicant responsibility here is to actually pay the engineering advance. And we'll talk about what the engineering advance is in a second and support the pg &E representative with additional project details as, as needed. The timeline here is approximately 90 to 180 days. And, and Nick Mosizon um, can talk a little bit more about the, the lengthiness of that timeline. And helpful links here is, is where you can actually make the payment online for that engineering advance. So the engineering advance is essentially a, an upfront payment that the customer is responsible for, for to cover the cost of PGE performing the load assessment. And the cost of that is approximately $2,500. Of course, that's subject to change, um, that which is different from the single family cost, which is about $1,250, I believe. And in the, in the unlikely, perhaps, case that um, it may just be you know, like for like replacements, that, that EA may be refunded um, at a later date. So, what exactly are we assessing when we talk about load assessments? So the relevant infrastructure for these types of applications are the service wire or cable, if it's underground, the secondary conductor, the transformer, and then again, kind of getting to what I mentioned a few slides ago, depending on the size of, of the building and the end uses being replaced, et cetera, the primary conductors as well. And, and if we need to go beyond just the primary conductors, we'll do that. And so the, the, the PG&E representative will assess the existing capacities of the, that infrastructure against the incremental load that you've presented in the application and ensure that, that the facilities are able to accommodate the incremental load along with everything else that it's serving. All right, next slide. Okay, so we wanted to spend just a couple of slides here, just walking you through. This one's illustrative, it's not based in, in, in any existing customer. We wanted to walk you through the, the kind of incrementality of electrification and the impacts of, of electrification on, on a site's load uh, based off of the two building types we're looking at here, which is multifamily and commercial. So this table has, as again, an illustrative example, a 10 unit multifamily building that might have gas water heating, gas space heating, and, and perhaps gas cooking. This is an extreme example. From what I understand, this might not be as common in San Francisco and Oakland. So pre-electrification, you might see a, a demand of five kVA or so per living unit. Post-electrification, electrifying the space and water heating, electrifying the cooking. Um, on the high end, you might double that and see 10 kVA per living unit. Hopefully you're, you're, you're adopting some of the things that John talked about and Barry talked about and in terms of you know, lower amperage um, appliances and such. But if not, this is the type of incremental load that you might see in this particular illustrative case. 
let's say you have a commercial kitchen um, with gas cooking and perhaps gas water heating. Pre-electrification, you might see somewhere between seven and 10 kVA and post-electrification after electrifying your cooking, maybe even your water heating if you have that, um, you might see somewhere between 25 and, and 35 kVA. So there is, there is a step up in terms of usage, of course, as a result of electrifying. This is an example just focused on building electrification. All right, next slide. So this one is looking at transportation electrification. And this one actually isn't illustrative. It's based in uh, a couple of real examples that are in the Bay Area. So we have a multifamily building somewhere in Oakland. And this multifamily building installed around 100 or so level two charging ports for a total incremental load of around 720 kW. And the necessary upgrades as a result of that incremental load was a meter panel, switch gear, and transformer upgrade. On the far right, in the, in the next column, you have a commercial building. I think this one might be a workplace somewhere in the Bay Area. And they installed around 30 level two charging ports or so um, for an incremental load of 216 kW. And they required meter panel, switch gear, an additional transformer. And this is an example of where there were there was an upstream uh, upgrade required. So they had to switch out a three phase switch. So putting together the impacts of building and transportation electrification, you could see again, um, some, some upgrades needed, not just at service, but at the primary when you put those two together. Great. All right. So contract and payment, getting back to the to the stages here. So PG&E responsibility here is completing the estimating, design, and sending the final contract. The applicant responsibility is signing the contract and paying for any necessary customer costs. We'll talk about those costs in a slide or two. The timeline here is, is approximately 180 days. And a helpful tip here is that the more detailed the load application is, the, the more expeditious the process might be. I think the other thing that Nick might say is that, you know, turn these applications in, in early, start the process early, especially if you're looking to move fairly quickly. So the steps here first starts with the site visit. PG&E will coordinate a site visit with the customer to assess the scope of the project. And then next we have the putting together the job packet. So PG&E will design and estimate any necessary service or if necessary primary work associated. And then finally here, we have the contract right up. And so based off of the job package, PG&E will, will draft up a contract for the customer to sign. And, um, and also the, con the customer will, will pay for any necessary costs on, on their side. One note here is that the engineering advance that I talked about a couple of slides ago will be applied to the final contract cost. All right, next slide. Not working? Okay, perfect. So here we dig a little bit deeper into the customer side costs. So of course here, there's no responsibility on pg and side and the applicant responsibility here is signing the contract and completing the payment. Timing here is, is dependent largely on applicant payment timeline. So when they actually um, you know, make the payment. So the, the first thing I wanna say here is I'm gonna call back to electric rule 15 and 16. Electric rule 15 and 16, again, governed by the CPUC, outlines what the customer's responsibility is responsible for as far as making payments. It also identifies or outlines a, a, an allowance. So from a customer perspective, you might think of it as a credit, if you will, that customers receive. And so for um, the text here on the, the top left, residential applicants, or for the purposes of this conversation, multifamily applicants, are responsible for paying all the upfront costs associated with service installation, but they do they are granted an allowance of just over three thousand dollars per meter for that's applied to any of the refundable portions of, of costs. For non-residential applicants, so for our, our commercial buildings, the allowance is determined on a case-by-case -case basis based off of the expected usage or consumption of, of the of the building. 
top variables that impact cost. So we have here very similar to single family uh, panel location and its distance from the nearest point of distribution. A transformer, if a single customer is on a transformer, they're usually responsible for the cost of that transformer. Um, and then if the service is underground, any excavation costs, so trenching. So the types of customer costs over there on the far right, um, I mentioned this already, trenching, any substructure or conduit installations, this is mainly for, for, for uh, underground service and any protective structure. All right, nearing the end here. Construction and energization. That's the next and final stage of the added load process. PGE responsibility here is completing the service installation and any applicable distribution betterment work. Applicant responsibility is, is completing projects and any required inspections. The timeline for PGE's work is about a month and a half to, to three months for PGE's work. First step here is the pre-construction meeting. So PGE will coordinate a meeting to align on align with the customer on utility tasks versus customer tasks, and to the extent feasible, coordinate any inspections for customer construction. The customer will complete substructure installation if they are receiving underground service and any inspections. So, for example, the green tag inspection, and then finally service installation and energization. So PGE will install the new service and coordinate, disconnect, reconnect while the customer completes any, any of the behind the meter work necessary. All right, I think that we're, this is the last slide here. So gas disconnection process, we thought that this was important to, to provide, especially given that uh, Oakland and San Francisco have uh, full electrification type targets in mind. So once the building has converted from dual fuel to all electric, you can safely stop gas service and gas interconnection by applying to modify your existing services. So you'd go to the same portal that we talked about before, except the steps might be a little bit different. Um, so you can see that in the in the picture here in the bottom left. I won't go through that in much detail. That's there. And why would you stop gas service? Well, there is a safety component associated with this. So um, by stopping gas service, you would be, by, by stopping gas service when you're all electric, I wanna clarify, um, you'd be eliminating safety concerns during accidental dig-ins or, or any other damage. There's also a cost component associated as well. So customers are responsible for a minimum charge of about 13 cents per day for a transportation fee to remain connected to the, to the gas system. And then finally, a, 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 a common question that we get is who pays for removing the gas system. So any gas service greater than 10 years will be removed at PG&E's expense. Um, and many of the, the buildings in California are, are much older than 10 years. So that would apply to most cases. With that said, that concludes our presentation. Um, I lied, there's actually one more slide, but it just outlines that, that there are helpful resources that are available to folks. We have the Pacific Energy Center that has on-demand classes that cover things like commercial installation of people and four heaters. We also have an induction loaner program um, that we're, we're looking to, to increase subscription of, um, where we offer burners, induction burners to, to folks that are interested and um, they can bring them back when they're done. So any, any folks out there have with commercial kitchens, please please uh, subscribe to that, that program. And with that, we thank you for your time and, and um, I think Nick's on, we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much to Khalil, to John, to Barry. Uh, this has been such an enlightening, uh, session so far and now we're going to dive into Q&A. So I want to invite the panelists to turn on their cameras and uh, we will be jumping right into the Q&A uh, in the official Q&A. So you, if you have direct questions, um, please put them there rather than in the chat. Um, going to be jumping around a little bit here, um, but uh, I'm going to start with Ryan's question. With this program and California's electric vehicle plan having similar time frames within five years of each other, he says, and, and I, I will actually uh, specify that the, the state of California has a carbon neutrality target of 2045, as the city of Oakland 
Um, so we are all kind of looking towards that for full decarbonization. He wants to know what are the plans to improve the state's electrical infrastructure so we don't have blackouts or fires like paradise, um, et cetera. So if uh, Nick or Khalil can take a stab at that, I know there's no certainty here, but if you can talk about preparation efforts, that'd be great. Maybe I can talk about some of our, our um, efforts around grid planning and Nick, you can you can talk about um, some of the things around PSPS and wildfire hardening and things of that nature. The, I think I skipped this actually on one of the slides that we had, but, but we are actively um, improving our grid planning processes and tools. We have most recently um, reached an agreement with the California Energy Commission to, for instance, utilize a higher um, a higher forecast for electric vehicles in our grid planning process. So that'll enable us to identify capacity constraints in advance and, and submit projects through the grid needs assessment um, that we do annually with the CPUC. So that's an example of, of work that we're looking to do to, to ensure that the grid is, is ready to support this incremental load. Um, we've also uh, developed a geospatial tool um, that takes top-down for uh, EV forecasts and allocates them across the service territory um, to get a better understanding of, of when and where we're expecting to see different types of charging infrastructure load. So from level two to workplace charging, to public BC fast charging, to fleet charging, and that'll help us get more proactive and get ready for, for all of this load that we're anticipating as a result of some really clear and um, aggressive policy targets that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So. Two examples of ways in which we're looking to get ready proactively. Um, and yeah, Nick, any, any additional thoughts there? No, I don't have anything to add to that question okay. or answer. Great, was, uh, thank you. Of course, just being thematically aligned uh, where um, Ted Tiffany's asking about, um, maybe paraphrasing a little bit, uh, are there options so that the design engineers on a project might understand the uh, ability of the grid in the short term to accommodate service capacity upgrades at an individual site? I think that one's for you, Nick. Sorry. No, it's okay. I don't think I understand the question. Oh, well, sure. So I, um, he's ask, he's pointing out that the a way that things commonly work is if um, the engineers designing a project don't know what the capacity of the local grid is to ex accommodate additional load, then they're investing time in design without that information and then may learn after the fact that there wasn't capacity or there may take time to upgrade upstream infrastructure. And so he's asking, is there a way that the project engineers might know early on in their project, uh, what the capacity of the grid is in the area of their, they're proposing to construct something uh, to accommodate it added load. Okay, uh, so this is a uh, difficult question to give a definitive answer because capacity is always changing. Uh, capacity diminishes, capacity grows, you know, pg e is constantly uh, continuing to uh, add capacity, but at the same time, the the demand requirements in on certain circuits are growing as well. Um, so, the best way to determine if there will be, in fact, if there will be capacity uh, in the area where you are proposing a project, is to file an application as soon as possible and give that. So, so say for instance, we do this with large load and large load is considered anything over uh, 2.5 NBA where we get, we get involved with these projects very early on where <clears throat> they provide their proposed loads and we'll do load studies. I always urge customers, if you're anything greater than 500 KBA, file your application early um, and work with the service planner and the local uh, electric planning engineer to determine what what the uh, loading looks like and what capacity work will be necessary, if any. Uh, so the applicant is responsible for everything up to the nearest distribution point if they're if they are uh, 
uh, upgrading their service. Uh, and pg e is responsible for everything beyond that. Now, if the applicant is adding load to an existing service and not changing the size of their main switch, the size of their termination section, then pg e would be responsible for any work from the termination section out to wherever needed to be uh, upgraded to deem it adequate to serve. Uh, the key there, though, is... It, uh, if adding a load greater than 75 kVA per rule 16, pg e does have the right to require transformer space. And what that means is, let's say, for instance, that the applicant uh, has an existing 800 amp three-phase service, okay, and they're adding load. Um, and pg e the existing distribution does not have, the existing distribution transformer does not have the capacity to serve that additional load. pg e has the right to require transformer space. The applicant would provide space on their property for a dedicated transformer. pg e would be responsible for the cost of the transformer and the cable, and the applicant would be responsible for the space and the substructures. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. I know it probably added a few more questions, but <laughs> yeah, there you I think with the question, the question asked was kind of getting at like real time tools that um... we don't. Yeah, we don't have a we don't have a real time tool that provides access to what existing. So the the trouble with that is is we could give you we could give you what the the capacity is on a circuit today, and two three months from now that capacity is changed. Okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, there, there is like we uh, think that there is. We have an integrated capacity analysis map. Um, it's not as it, it doesn't get down to like the secondary system. I think it's it's primarily a primary. Uh, but a, a part of the feedback that we get from customers is um, that is not real time. And given the difficulties that Nick just outlines, that you know, uh, it's difficult to make it real time and. And they'll, they'll, they, they might look at that map and, and see that there's capacity on, on a piece of equipment um, one month and then the next month see that that's gone. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to get real time, but there is interest in, in, in trying to develop a tool that, that gets closer to real time that, that um, customers might use and engineers might use. I don't have many details on that, but there is interest, I think, at the, at the company and, and um, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, the, the only way currently to actually reserve is really the wrong word, but it's the only word I can think of right now. Reserve the capacity for yourself is to have is to have a package put together, have a design generated by PG&E and e and have the contract generated and then sign and pay that contract. That's really, truly the only way to reserve said capacity. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm gonna try to um, get through these uh, as many as possible, um, as quickly as possible. I wanna to turn to um, Heriberto's two questions, which I think are interrelated. So one is, what are the thoughts on using smart panels to manage loads and keep existing service? Um, and then he also asks, uh, he says, it seems that when going all electric, the service seems bigger on paper due to code safety factors. Uh, he's wondering if there's any chance code will get revised accordingly. Uh, and he's, he notes that typical building use is uh, just 30 to 60% of what they're designed for. Um, so, you know, we're looking at panel optimization, which could be load, man load management widgets, but it also could be, you know, strategic use of um, load calculations and, and uh, the code. So maybe I'm gonna hand this one to John first and then uh, others can jump in. Thanks. Yeah, so I can take a little bit on the smart panel uh, side of things. So the use case we've seen, uh, permitted use case we've seen for smart panels to date has been around um, managing electric vehicle uh, loads. Um, there's definitely a use case that we see to manage sort of behind the meter loads or within a building or within an apartment uh, to use smart panels uh, to sort of stick within a existing sort of service size. Um, and smart panel, just for the other folks on the, I guess on the webinar here, are um, electrical panels that have 
the ability to sort of turn on and off breakers or triage load based on sort of you know a demand reading. Um, I haven't seen a permitted smart panel installation yet that allows for load triage um, for non EV sort of use cases. Uh, but I'd be really interested to see if PGE or anybody else on the panel here has seen uh, an AHJ allow that. Um, and on the, just taking the second question on the code, I haven't seen anything in the news about uh, whether you know code is going to become less stringent or more you know generous in terms of those sort of safety factors. Um, but uh, there was an interesting idea presented uh, earlier in the chat about sort of doing phased work um, in combined with sort of the load study process. So uh, there is a world where you could do phase one electrification, actually confirm what that impact looks like, measure, study it, and then have an engineer say, okay, well, that only added this much load, not this much load, which is what it looks like on paper. So we still have more capacity and then sort of incrementally um, sort of do work in phases. So that might be a workaround that exists. Barry or Nick or Khalil, do you want to um, add anything to that? Uh, I mean, I'm curious, maybe just to point it at PGE, does do, do the uh, output from customers, potential customers, load calcs that includes a um, demand management tool such as a smart panel, is, is that something you consider in doing your own um, diversity factor analysis? or your own load analysis? So for right now, uh, I haven't seen any smart panels. Even with a smart panel, the, 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 it is likely that the service termination will be right, rated for the maximum allowable uh, uh, demand on that panel. So while the smart panel may be able to manage it, say for instance, you have a 1200 amp service termination, but the smart panel is limiting it to 800 amps. pg &E would still see that as a 1200 amp service. So um, I haven't had any personal experience with them. I don't know how we would deal with that just because we don't have any experience with that yet. Uh, I'm sure when it, if, if it becomes something that will be utilized, uh, you know, adjustments will be made, but I can't really speak to it. For now, the standard is whatever the service termination size is, that's what pg and &E designs based on. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick and John. Um, all right, switching gears a little bit. Can you talk about the new rule 29? in which pg &E proposes to cover costs that are typically paid by the building owner if a new meter is being installed for EV charging. Yeah, um, I'm curious what specifically they'd like to hear, but Rule 29 came from a bill called AB 841. Um, and one of the requirements from that bill was that there be uh, energization, standard energization timelines set um, from application to energization for um, non-residential EV projects. And so that is an open proceeding overseen by the California Public Utilities Commission right now, um, where many parties have submitted proposals. The utilities jointly have submitted a proposal for an average timeline of, I think, 180 days. Um, and we've also um, submitted proposals for what part of the application to energization timeline should be um, under the, 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 the kind of oversight of the CPUC and, and governed by this rule um, and which one shouldn't. Perhaps what the question was kind of getting at was what does Rule 29 cover versus Rule 16? Rule 29 covers any of the service upgrade costs that would normally be charged to the customer under Rule 16 including civil construction. So including things like trenching, those costs would be borne by rate payers um, instead of by the, the customer. Happy to answer anything else on that one. I think, I think that's great. Um, 
let's see. I'm gonna uh, go to a question that that uh, just came in. What happens when capacity uh, is reduced as the project progresses? Is the customer guaranteed the capacity approved when the application is first submitted? Is capacity on a line provided first come first serve? Uh, it's based on when the design is uh, when the design is completed, contract is executed, and when it's actually being installed. There's a lot of move. There's there there are a few moving parts, so it's, there's it's there is no fixed. Like once you sign a certain document, that capacity is reserved for you. It's really based on what the timelines are. Because let's say that you sign a contract in 2022, you know, and then you don't actually do any of your work until 2024 we have to redesign um and the capacity the capacity uh dynamic may have changed so um i'm always urging customers to you know file your application yes as early as possible but don't file it so early that you're way out in front of of your actual work because it could be misleading um i mean and and not Capacity is is capacity is a uh, is an important issue, but we don't have capacity issues everywhere. You know, I we don't want customers. I don't want customers to think that just because they're adding load that we're going to run into a capacity issue. That's not necessarily the case. Um, so yes, if you're adding a thousand kva that's that's a big deal one mva uh that's a big deal but if you're if you're adding 100 kva 150 kva something like that you know it's not likely that that's going to be an issue now you know obviously every circuit is different um uh, but yet yeah, I, I don't want folks to think that that capacity is going to be an issue for every job it isn't Shayna, can I yeah. add something real quick? Um, I don't know if I, in my Rule 29 monologue, I don't know if I said this, but that's that's for electric vehicle projects, not, not for building electrification projects. Just wanted to clarify that. Not residential either. All right, thank you. Oh, John, go ahead. I was just wanted to sort of continue the conversation with Nick on the same point. I'm seeing a question from Jack about sort of the back and forth dance that might occur as the project is trying to understand um, what available capacity there is, PG&E's capacity situation is sort of changing. And I'm assuming we're going to be sort of in these smaller numbers, at least for like smaller commercial multifamily buildings. And I'm wondering if you could just talk through the process of like that initial application to learn what the capacity is. Then the design team needs to sort of redesign potentially to sort of ideally fit within the available capacity you have. Like how does that sort of back and forth tend to play out in your experience? Uh, so in a lot of cases, the projects that I've worked with where we've had capacity issues is, is they design for 100% of what their desired desired demand is, and then the, the, the load is phased on. So you have, you, have phasing, you have phasing to allow for portions of a project to, to come online versus the entire project coming online all at one time. So it gives the it gives PG the opportunity to increase capacity while at the same time allowing the, the, the customer to proceed with at least a portion of their project. Um, like I said, it's it's going to depend heavily on on what capacity is available and and how much load is being added. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, like I said, it's, it's capacity isn't going to be an issue for every project. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Nick. I wanted to go um, back to a topic we were talking about earlier with kind of a more in-depth question that uh, Ted asked. Uh, he's asking if we can talk about the latest changes to utility rules for separate service metering for EV charging stations and the potential to share load technology, potential for share lo shared load technology that can allow EV charging and heat pump water heating sharing, for instance. Um, I know we covered that a bit, but he's asking specifically where PG&E is going with virtual load panels like Stan.io and Genius 
that can control non-coincident loads within a lower service size. Um, so I haven't had any experience with them personally. Um, my interpretation of how those services would be sized would be the termination would probably be sized so that it would serve, have the capacity to serve all proposed load in the event of a failure of, of the, the monitoring system. Um, I mean, outside of that, uh, and, and like I said earlier, <clears throat> if you have a 1200 amp service termination, but you have a smart panel that's allowing, um, allowing these two services to kind of uh, take load as their demand, as, you know, diminish demand on one while increasing demand on the other. It, it's, we haven't seen any of those. I haven't seen any of those yet come through. Um, don't have any personal experience with them. Can't really answer that question because I don't have any experience with them. But like, it's, it's still my understanding that in the event of a failure of that monitoring system, the service would still be sized so that it could serve 100% of that potential connected load or demand. I was just going to say, there are other EV charging products on the market that do sort of like a packaged, balanced, um, or variable sort of charging approach um, that the connected load is not the sum of all of the chargers. The connected load is sort of like the, the actual serv max service size that the utility provides and like what's provided with the overcurrent protection. And then the sort of third party product sort of like can send out, you know, higher power to this car at this moment and then sort of ramp that down and then send power over to a different car that's charging. So I, I know there are systems like that that are currently being installed. I don't know if that answers your question, Ted. And then one thing I want to add to that is there is a switch that protects the service. There's, you have the overcurrent protection. While yes, there is that monitoring system that <clears throat> that keeps, you know, figuratively keeps an eye on all of the charging systems. But in the event of a failure of that of that monitor, the mechanical switch is there to protect the service. So maybe just to clarify, because I think I was misunderstanding your response, Nick. So, so it's the scale of that mechanical switch protecting the service that determines the service sizing. That 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 that's your bottom line. Is that one hundred percent? Yes, one hundred percent. Cool. Okay, great. Um, maybe a quick question: Does the zero dollar cost for capping gas? apply also to removing some, but not all meters on a gas riser, uh, such as if a few units are made all electric, but not the entire building. So the meters can be removed. We, yeah, pg e would remove the meters at no expense. Uh, it's part of the rate. Um, uh, and then you would discontinue gas service uh, to those particular units. You would want to make it You'd call this seven four three five eight hundred seven four three five thousand to completely discontinue gas service that you've removed gas service from those units. Um, so yes, removing the meters would be no expense, um, but there would still be that the other units would still carry that. The, they would still receive a, a month every bill and pay that transportation fee, but uh, and then the uh, monthly per meter charge, but. Um, yeah, meter removal is at no charge. Okay, great. And um, kind of related, uh, when applying for gas disconnection, will PG&E allow flexibility in green book requirements for the location of the electric meters in proximity to the gas meter that would be removed? In some projects, the best location for the electrical infrastructure is within three feet of the gas meter. Um, and changing the location of the panel can lead to uh, significantly increased capital costs and tr trigger additional scope. So what's the, what, what's the flexibility or recommended process there? I think the nuance just looking at the question though is mm -hmm. when the gas meter is going to be removed, but it's right. not currently removed, is there flexibility in saying, yeah, we're gonna put the electric gear sort of in this spot knowing the gas meter is going away? Thanks, John. Yeah. So Nick or Khalil? Uh, well, currently there isn't any flexibility. We have to, if it's a pressurized gas facility and we're energizing it, so because there will be a short period of cutover, 
So you'll be cutting over your old service to your new service. And in the event of a, of a regulator venting or the regulator itself fails and it's venting gas into the air, you have a source of ignition that's within that three feet area. And uh, it still doesn't, that, that doesn't meet the minimum requirements. So while yes, it will be removed, it isn't removed and, and still we have to adhere to that three foot required minimum clearance. One concept that came up in the single family workshop was was project staging. I'm confident that this gets thought of, of course, by, by our speakers, but um, to the extent you could complete the uh, removal of the gas device uh, or be, uh, for example, meet your health and safety needs first, then cut off gas service and maybe not have some of your functional needs. So for more specifically, switch over your water heater and do the space heating after the gas has been disconnected. Um, there'd be complexity to that, but that would that might be one way to um, avoid the double doubling up on the electric uh, service location costs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let's see if we can do uh, a tricky question in two minutes or less, and then we'll wrap up. And I just want to uh, assure everybody that uh, for any questions that are not answered. We will get together the panelists and answer them and send that out in the meeting notes. So Eric asks, pg e service agreement requires customers to inform them of any changes in connected load, although when loads are added, they don't require a service upgrade. This is really, if ever, actually reported to pg and &E. uh, Can we discuss this? Does pg and &E really have the bandwidth to process that information about all the owner side work that doesn't trigger upgrades? This would be a big paperwork burden for all parties. Yeah, actually, the uh, rule uh, the rules actually require that if you're changing the characteristics of your service and adding load is changing the characteristics of your service, you're required to submit an application for service to PG&E to notify PG&E of this change. Um, so, I yes, it is our responsibility to review that um, in service planning. And, and yes, applicants are, you know, customers, applicants are required to, um, yeah, here it is, electric rule three. Sorry, I was opening up something on my computer to, uh, to look. Yeah, so app, electric rule three, and uh, Khalil, maybe we could get this uploaded as part of the pres presentation, but uh, here we go. Uh, 3C, change of customer's apparatus or equipment. In the event that the customer shall make any material change either in the amount or character of the electric lamps, appliances, or apparatus installed upon the premises to be supplied with electric energy, the customer shall immediately give PG&E written notice of this fact. Um, so, yes. Thank you. I mean, that, that's definitely the book. Is there a practical context for that? I mean, clearly, I don't call it in when I plug in a new LED lamp at my house. So it so seems like scale matters. There, is there context? So in a, absolutely. So so say, for instance, something like uh, electric demand in a residence is based on square footage, okay, unless there is special load. Like, say, for instance, that you are a hobbyist welder, okay, or you have a car lift. Uh, those are special loads or EV charging. That's a special load. Um, in that case, you would disclose if all of a sudden you decided, you know what, I'm going to take up, uh, uh, you know, whatever, and I'm going to put in a kiln. Okay, I'm putting in an electric kiln. Yeah, okay, so you have to report that because an electric kiln is going to be a large load for a residential service. Um, but for instance, if you decide, you know, I really don't like my two slice toaster. I really want a four slice toaster. You're not going to report something like that. So yes, it is scalable. I mean, it's like, no, we don't expect. And, and if all of a sudden you decide, you know, this 50 watt light bulb just isn't bright enough. I'm putting in a hundred. Um, stuff like that. No, you're not going to report that because it's already accounted for in your, in, in the demand calc that we did for that service. It's when you're adding, it's when you're adding, 
um, more special loads, or in the case of electrification, you're changing you're changing the characteristics of your service because now you're going from a gas water heater to an electric water heater. Yes, that's a significant change, especially if it is a tankless water heater. Tankless electric water heaters have a fairly high demand, um, so we need to be notified of that. Um, and then also with electric heating, fairly high demand as well. Um, so stuff like that, yes. Uh, stuff like adding a lamp, an extra lamp in a room, no, you're not, you're not going to do that. But when you're changing appliances from gas to electric, that is where that comes, that change of characteristics clause comes into play. Okay, and with that, we have a minute left in our allotted time. I want to respect everybody's time and uh, hunger levels. So uh, I can't thank the panelists enough, John, Nick, Khalil, Barry, and Jeffrey and Diana working behind the scenes. Um, again, we will be posting the slides and the recording in addition to any uh, you know, additional notes, which will include res uh, responding to the remaining questions that we didn't have time to get to. Thank you everyone for sharing some of your morning with us. And um, there's gonna be a lot more coming, uh, you know, in the next few years. So please uh, keep, your, keep your ears and your eyes out and uh, we look forward to ongoing discussion as this transition unfolds. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.